all right? But again, the first tutorial that's in here, this is that first one by Derek Bannis, is probably the best one. It is about 25 minutes or so, but he did a good job of going through some of the basics. And his extension one was pretty good too. Tim Corey's is fine, but it's just real serious, you know, et cetera. But if, if you really want to know and get good at this stuff, so to speak, all right, there is, I, I put in here six different URLs. Now I can go through all of them, but I don't know if it's going to be worth it. A lot of it is a rehash of what's in the chapter. But as you can see, there's query expression basics. This is the order in which I would recommend you read them. All right, then this is an overall thing on link, introduction to link queries, query syntax, how to query an array list, and finally, lambda expressions. All right, and again, some of them are better than others. Most of these are really pretty short. You probably read them in 10 or 15 minutes. So, And then finally, what I did was I brought this out there. This is uh, Tutorials Teacher is a really good site, and they have all sorts of different um, tutorials on just about everything IT that you can think of. The problem is with that one, it's very extensive. Probably would take you a good few hours to go through that. All right. And then finally, and there's more than one site like this, but this one, 50 link examples, tips and how to's, et cetera. All right. So with that, I'm just going to try to at least, um, jump right into the chapter. So I'm going to change my share on you in just a second. All right, hold on just a second here. There we go. Okay. All right. Okay. Let me stop my share and start it again. All right. Correct. Did you see on your screen 23 how to use link? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So again, that's what the chapter is about. This is going to be the only day that we discuss anything like, all right? And I do want to make sure, too, that you both realize, don't worry about turning in part two of that of um, the final program, all right? The only thing that you have to turn in yet, all right, both of you, is your electronic profile that we will go over a week from today, all right? So you can buy whole books on link, as you'd probably guess, all right? And the, the key thing is a couple takeaways are this, all right? And they mention it provides you with a way to query a data source. And a data source, not to be funny, but it's anything that holds data. So the data sources that we basically talked about in this class have been arrays, which we spent quite a bit of time on, and array lists, which we spent a little bit of time on. But to my knowledge, at least, before the advent of link, there was no way to treat arrays, and there was no way to treat lists as though they were databases. And that's the idea here, all right? Now, the other thing about this is, regardless of what you're using as a data set, you can use link on regular databases. You can use it on XML, which we haven't even talked about in here. You can use it on arrays. You can use it on collections. You can use it on array lists, et cetera. All right. But the syntax is the same regardless of what you use it on. And that's, that was a pretty big change because the way that you had to do some of this stuff previously before link you know, you, you had to go through a lot of conversions, basically, or take whatever you were working with and throw it in a database so that you could use regular old-fashioned SQL, SQL on it. All right. 
So at the end of the chapter, the author, as he says here, will present two applications. And it's basically the same thing. The output of the two applications is the same. I have them both up on, uh, on my computer right now. They both run. So the first one says is we're going to use link to objects. So we're going to query two generic lists. And what's a list? I mean, for example, imagine that you had a grocery list and that your spouse or significant other had a grocery list. All right. In fact, my wife and I were talking about this today, you know, what, you know, because I do venture out typically on the weekend and I go out early to Walmart. Well, let's assume that each one of us made a list of what we thought we needed. As you'd probably guess, there would probably be at least some repetition on there. So we would have our choice, all right, if something was important enough, do we get two of them? For instance, do we get two gallons of milk? Or if it's something that's not that important a thing, maybe I put down hot dog buns. Well, we only need one of those type of an idea. So when you do this stuff and you combine information from different lists, you've got your choice. You can do a union, which is everything, on both lists, you can do the opposite, which is basically an intersection, which is just the two things you have in common, et cetera. So there's a lot of ways that you can do that. The second example that's in there, we'll use what's called link to data set to query two different tables, all right? The, the nice thing about both of these is there's not really a lot of code in either one, all right? But the idea is notice, once you see how similar the queries for the applications are, you should begin to understand the real power of using link. You will, by no means, do you become an expert by going through this chapter. All right. But again, I think I mentioned this to you yesterday, but on the off chance I did not, there are two different ways that you can actually write this stuff. You can code what are called query expressions. And you can code what are called lambda expressions. You may or may not realize this, but we have actually looked a little bit at lambdas before. So it may happen that when we look at this, this may look familiar to you, to you rather, syntactically. All right. But first, I want to go through this, how link is implemented, the advantages, and especially these three stages. If you want a greater explanation then what I'm giving you from the book here, you can go back to those URLs that I sent you this morning, all right? As you can see, then we go into coding query expressions and many, many of the examples they put in here are really, really simplistic, all right? So they first show you some of them, how to do them with query expressions and then how to do some of the same ones as Lambda expressions. I will tell you without a doubt, in my humble opinion, that when you're first learning this, query expressions may actually be a little bigger, but I think they're more intuitive and easier to understand than lambdas are. The thing about lambda expressions is you can use them in virtually every language. And I'm not talking about using lambdas with, with, with link. I'm just talking about using lambdas, period. I know that I went over lambdas with the people in the um, Java Android class this semester, all right? So again, then when we get done, we're gonna go over basically the same app, two different customer invoice applications. The first one with generic lists, the second one with a type data set. And each one of them is only three or four pages long. So it's not like they're really big. All right, so let's see how Link is implemented. Let's just, let's just start right there. It says link is implemented as a set of methods that are defined by enumerable and queryable classes, okay? And basically, chapter 15, back in this book, and we did go over that a long time ago, all right, did talk about the I enumerable, all right? And if you say, well, I don't remember what that is, go back and take a look, but it's not really that important. All right, basically what they're saying is it can be used on things like lists, arrays, array lists, et cetera. All right, let's see. So I'm gonna go into the next page in just a second, but as it says, 
they'll talk about the clauses that you'll most likely use. And we're going to go through that in just a minute. But first, as they say there, some of the advantages of using link. The first one, as it says, you can use a wide variety of data sources using the same language or as I mentioned to you earlier, using the same syntax regardless of what the underlying data source is. All right. So it says there the key to making this work is that the language is integrated into C Sharp. Because of that, you don't have to learn a different way, a different query language for each type. You're going to see that in just a second. The other thing, as they mention here, it says if you're working with a relational data source like SQL Server, all right, you can use their designer tools to develop what's called object relational mapping. Now, with object, with object relational mapping, this is my take on it, all right? Mr. Smith, if he was here right now, might listen to what I'm saying and he might say, I don't agree with that. You might be able to find books or articles where they're about to agree with what I'm gonna say and other ones that will disagree with what I'm gonna say. But they mentioned there that you can develop object relational mapping. With a lot of that stuff, it seems today that the push is is, is moving away from doing things as databases and in favor of doing those same things as working with classes. And that's to me what you really get with object relational mapping. Now that doesn't mean that queries and stuff go away, but with link, they're gonna look a little different. What do I mean? Well, first of all, instead of starting with select, the select part is, on the, is, is at the bottom or near the bottom. It starts with from, all right? You go from from to where to select. And as you can see here, you can have order by and you can do joins, etc. But when you first see it, at least, the syntax looks weird because you, you know, you're gonna say, well, wait a minute, we just learned SQL. It sort of looks like they took SQL and stuck it on its head. But if you can, if you, for example, if you say select star from queries, all right, where department name equal accounting. Now you're going to say something along the lines of from customers or whatever it is, where department name equal accounting select star. So it, it, you're just reversing the order of some of the stuff, but that pretty much works the same way. All right, now the advantage, again, more advantages, it provides a set of query operators that you get, for lack of better words, for free because they're built into the language. But you hear some of this stuff by calling extension methods. It's just those are built-in methods that you can call. And the other thing that you're going to see when you do this is when you, when you create the expression, if you ask for the results of the expression immediately, all right, that's what you get. But if you create the expression and you don't immediately ask for the results, what it does is it doesn't run the query until you ask for those results, all right? Plus what it does is it'll update the data so that even if you don't run the query again, so if I ran the query, now somebody comes in and add some records, changes some records, deletes some records, and I don't run the query again, but I ask for the results of the query a second time, it goes in the background basically, runs the query for me, and always tries to give me the most up-to-date data. And that's really a nice feature, all right? So the next thing that's in here, as mentioned, are these three stages of query operations. The first stage, stage rather, is you must have a data source. In this first example they're going to give here, it's a simple array of integers. It's got the numbers in there, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Again, a really simplistic example. All right. Then you have to figure out, okay, what do I want to do with this? In other words, as they're saying there, define your query. All right. We have to identify the data source. Well, it's going to be this array of integers and the data that we want to retrieve from them. In this example, we want the even integers from the array. 
Well, you know how to figure out an even integer. We've done programs like this much earlier in the semester. That if you take a number and you modulo it by two, if the result is zero, it's an even number. If the result is one, it's an odd number. All right. And also we want to put these, so we're going to use an order by to put them in descending sequence. All right. So it says, notice here that the query expression is stored in a query variable. This is what I just mentioned to you. It's necessary because the query is not executed when it's defined. All right. It, it's more or less what you're doing with this with this query variable you're creating a variable that has literally an actual query in it all right but it runs when you tell it to run so as instead it says rather it's given a type implicitly based on the type of elements returned by the query so it understands that in this case we want to return a list of integers so it's given the type i enumerable int and you can again look at that as basically being a list of integers. All right. Then they mention for this to work, the data source must implement either I enumerable or I enumerable T, where T can be basically anything. All right. And again, this was back in chapter 15. The good news is arrays do this, array lists do this. Any kind of collection implements I enumerable. All right. <clears throat> then the third stage, as it says, is to actually execute the query. Typically, the way that you do that is you use what's called a for each statement. We went over that many chapters ago. And a for each statement is just basically it's a for loop where the idea is it iterates or goes through an array, but it doesn't change any data. Can you use a regular for statement instead of a for each? The answer is definitely yes. Most people use for eaches because they work faster. All right. In this case, what we're doing is as we're finding out if a number is or is not an even number, we're adding it to a string variable. All right. Then when we're all done, we're displaying the results in a message box. All right, and it should have four, two, and zero in it. The author also mentions in here, it looks a little weird because they have two tab characters in here. And the reason they have two tab characters in there is because the title they put into the message box. If they left it off, part of the title would be, would be truncated or you wouldn't be able to see it. Not that it's a big thing one way or another, it isn't. But this is the last paragraph on the page here. When you define a query, but do not execute Im it immediately, it's called a deferred execution query, meaning that you are going to defer it and call it when you want to call it. On the other hand, you can set up a query that's when, as soon as you define it, define it rather, it runs. That's called an immediate execution query. And they say there, when would you want to use that? Well, a good example of when you'd want to use that would be when you're working with um, the aggregate functions that we've talked about. So maybe you want to go through a, a, a data list right now and you want to find, maybe it's a list of, of uh, sales bought by, big, you bought by your customers. And you want to find what product, you know, customers bought the most or something like that. All right, and you want to find out right now then you would use an immediate execution query. And they're going to show you examples of all of these in here. All right. So again, get the data source to find the query, execute the results. So what are we doing here? Okay. Well, right here, we're coming in and we're defining the array. What are they doing here? You know this. This is defining an empty array with elements 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 in it. All right. And here we're saying, while it's less than that length, all right, just fill it up. So that's literally going to fill it up with 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. They could have done this by just saying int bracket bracket 
numbers equal new int. And then they could have had curly braces there that said 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Or they could have had random numbers that they created in here. All of that stuff by now, you should understand what I'm talking about. And you would be able to do that if you had to. You have done that before. So that's defining the array right there. Then this is the first time you're seeing link and that's right here in the blue. All right. So notice from number, number is a variable we're making up right here. And typically when you create an array, you give it a pluralized name. So from an individual number in the numbers array, come in for each one, take the individual number, divide it by two, check the remainder. If the remainder is zero, you want to select that number and add it to number list. When you get all done, you want to order it in descending order. All right, so again, they have a very simple example here. I think it would have been a better example if they would have gotten, you know, six random numbers, but they didn't. The, I think what they're doing is they're just concentrating on it, trying to make it as simplistic as possible. Sometimes I think where not just me, but all teachers fail as teachers is we assume when we give you maybe the first example of doing something, rather than giving you something really simplistic like this, we give you something that's similar to what you've had before as far as the quality, you know, et cetera, but maybe it's too hard as a first example. <clears throat> so then finally, what does this do? Well, notice this is creating right here, <clears throat> it's creating a brand new variable called number display. It's going to be a string. Then in the for each loop, and again, it's just, it's a personal thing, but I would have put uh, curly braces before this line and after this line. But all we're doing is we're displaying the number. All right, and after we display the number, we're putting, you know, we're making sure there's a blank line after it. All right, so it says, give me that number display. So that's what it's creating right here. <clears throat> So tab, tab, okay. So give me the number, tab, tab, new line. Give me another number, tab, tab, new line. Give me another number, and it does another tab, tab, new line. Then it displays everything, that's it. Now I'm not even gonna say, did that totally make sense? But the key takeaway here is looking at the syntax there, realizing that it's very similar in many ways to what we've already done. It's not identical. All right, stuff's moved around, but even then it's not identical. But the point is, this right here is creating an expression. This says, when you use number list down below, replace number list with this. This is not immediately running it. You don't run it until you have the for each loop and you do it down here, all right? So this is one of those deferred execution queries, in other words. All right. <clears throat> and I love this because this, this is how Muroc writes books. Now that you have a basic understanding of what a link query is, you may or you may not, all right? But they are going to give you a bunch of examples that are in here. So as it says, the first example in the figure will show you how to use the from clause with an array of decimals named to sales totals. One thing to notice is when we did this, when we did this example that we just looked at, all we looked at was numbers that are divisible by two, all right, even numbers. We could have added more things onto that. Maybe we want even numbers, uh, but they have to be greater than zero. So in other words, that would have shown us four and two, but it would not show have shown us zero. So this is a very simple where clause, but we could have, had we wanted to, put a lot more in it than that. All right, so the first example is pretty simple. The second example is much more complicated because now what we're doing is we're using a list of invoices. So what we're doing here in this example is we're saying, okay, 
what I want you to do is I want you to grab all these sales totals, boom, 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 and I want you to add them up. That's it. So from sales in sales totals, so sales totals, that's the name of the data source. Sales is something we're making up. So this is saying select each of the elements of this array. Then down here in our for each statement, all we're saying is go through it and now add them up. So in other words, this is the same thing as though we said 1286.43 plus 2433.49 plus 2893.85 plus 2094.53. <clears throat> so that's a pretty simple example. With the second example they have here, it's much more complex. <clears throat> But what we're doing is we are telling them to come in here and iterate through. So we're imagining here we have a list of invoices. All right. And we're calling get invoice. And what will get invoice do? It'll do something like this. If we had four customers and those were their invoice totals, that's what get invoice would be returning for us. And then we're doing the same kind of thing. We're just saying go through and add them. Also notice it might seem simple. Make sure you say plus equals there and not equals, because that's saying add each one. Keep a running total there and there. So as the author mentions here, the from clause identifies the data source, all right? In the range variable, you use a query expression, why? To just get what you want. The from clause must be the first, and a query expression must end with either a select clause or a grouping type of clause where you're gonna be grouping stuff together, all right? So you use the where in the same way we've been using where all along, and that is as a filter. So if we want only, like they'll show in this first example, if we want only sales totals that are greater than 2,000, you back up to where we just were, what does that say? We want that one, we want that one, we want that one, but we don't want this one. All right? So again, you can use where to filter out your clauses. <clears throat> and they again do the same thing. And you can see by taking a look right there how the where clause has changed. In fact, in the previous example, we didn't have a where clause. So it said, grab everything. All right, but we already did look at a where clause where we said where the number modulo two equals zero. So again, you are still using exactly as you did before. You are still coming in here and you are using the where to filter. All right. <clears throat> and again, it's the same kind of thing in both examples. So the where lets you filter, the condition is coded as a Boolean expression, and it can have relational operators and logical operators. Our relational operators are greater than, greater than, or equal to, less than, less than, or equal to, equal to, and not equal to, and our logical operators are and, and, or, and not. All right. You use order by in the same way we've been using it previously. And when you do an order by, notice it's one word now as opposed to two, not like that's a big thing. Don't put it as two because I think it'll, it'll flag that as an error if you do. And you can, if you want, put ASC at the end. You can also put the word ascending. You can put DESC at the end or the word descending. <clears throat> And quite often, not always, but quite often, not in this example here, but quite often when you work with numeric values like this, you'll want them in descending order. Typically with names, you know, person names, company names, product names, you would typically want those to be in ascending order. It's not that you have to do that, just people are more used to seeing things that way. So again, the order by clause 
lets you specify how the results are sorted. All right. So how to select fields from a query. If you don't have it select certain fields, you get everything. All right. And they mentioned a query that returns something other than the entire data source is referred to as a projection. All right. All this stuff, it basically, it all goes back, back to mathematical terms, whether you care or not. It's not really a big thing one way or the other. All right. So as it says, the first example uses a sorted list called employee sales. The keys for this list are the name and the values are the sales totals. All right. The expression that uses the list includes the form where and order by clauses. It asks only for those elements, those sales totals greater than 2000, and it uses the order by on them. So they mention here the for each is just like the other ones that you've used. The bottom line is this as you go through this, by default, if you are, especially if you are working with a class, you get everything. But you don't normally, you don't necessarily rather have to do that. All right. So when you start to do this, and this is where it looks a little bit weird. If you did happen to watch the, the first video that I showed you yesterday, the first Derek Bannis one, you would have seen examples like this. Because what it'll do is it'll go through your list and what you put in the curly braces here and here it'll build a new list for lack of better words. All right. So what you're doing here is you've got these numbers, but all we want in here, all we want is the sales that were greater than 2000. And we don't even want that. We want the name of the salesperson who had sales greater than 2000. There are their names. All right. And it's, it's funny because I remember, I know I mentioned this gentleman to you before, but talking to my friend, John, who was a student of mine many, many years ago, and I, I haven't talked to him in years, but I remember one of the last times I talked to him about this. And I said, you know, I always tell students that you never know when a marketing person or a manager is going to come up to you and ask you for something. And you might even think that what they're asking you for is for lack of better words, bizarre. And he just basically, he agreed. He said some of the reports that he had to create based on queries, it was like, who the heck would want this information? But he's like, you know, I, I'm an underling. I don't run the place. So if somebody says, hey, can you present a report to me that goes through our data and finds the X, Y, and Z? He said, I can do it. All right. So again, the select clause indicates the data you want to return. A query that returns anything other than the entire thing is called a projection. That's what those examples showed. All right. To return two or more fields from each element, you use an object initializer. And that's what you have here. It's sort of like a key value pair. Key, value, key, value type of thing. And again, you'll notice on here that out of the four that are in there, the only one not mentioned down here is Anderson because you only wanted people with sales, the names of people with sales greater than 2000. He did not meet that criteria. All right. As they say, if the object initializer doesn't specify a type, it creates its own that it refers to as an anonymous type. All right. Okay, let's quickly go through this. You can join data from two or more data sources. What does that mean? you know how to do joins and how to do joins on, for example, tables. All right. Well, what are we doing here? We've got two different lists. We've got an invoice list and we've got a customer list. So we're doing a join, but again, just as we've done with joins in the past, there has to be a field in common. And here it's customer ID. So from invoice in invoice list, join customer in customer list. So invoice list and customer list are our two lists where, well, we can put criteria in there. All right. But what we're saying in here is we want to join on the customer IDs. 
if we wouldn't have put that criteria in there, we would have gotten everyone, not just those with an invoice total of greater than 150. And again, you'll see when you look down here, there's the select, there's an order by. Remember, the thing on the bottom either has to be a select statement or a grouping type of statement. This is again when you run the query. And when you look down here, you'll notice that every one of these, and they're not put in any kind of order, but every one of them is greater than 150. So if one of the lists, one of the items in there would have been exactly 150, it would not have shown because we wanted only those greater than 150. All right, I'm gonna stop right here and I'm going to go in and load a new URL for you because I'm getting right to the end. It's 841, just in case, because sometimes I have problems with this. Let's start up again at 850 in about 10 minutes. So go ahead and drop off, come back please at 850 and we'll hopefully finish this up in about one more lecture.